welcome to our first panel session of the Women in Literature Festival, which will look at 100 years of women in literature. Quite a fitting start, I believe, to a festival that is meant to celebrate the voices of women in literature that have been around for so long and are often neglected. Uh, this panel will be talking about looking beyond the male-centric ideologies that we often see in literary conversations and celebrating the works of authors like Virginia Woolf, Maya Angelou, Simone de Beauvoir, Isma Chuktai, and many, many others. Uh, and the panelists that we have are absolutely amazing, who I will introduce to you now. And it's such an honor for me to be in their presence today. We are joined by Lakshana Palat, who is an author, a journalist, a history graduate, and has written stories for three anthologies, uh, When They Spoke, Mocktails, and Readomania's Book of Romance. In 2018, she also published her first book, The Final Word. We are also joined by Taiba Abbas, who is the founder of Allah Books and Authors, and is the co-author of Allah's upcoming publication, The Night in Her Hair. Now, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. We are also going to be joined shortly by Fai Kamansa, who is the author of This House of Clay and Water. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yes. So let's start off with uh, talking about this gender revolution of literature, so to speak, that's been happening around the world in different parts uh, and in different ways. Uh, you know, you have authors like Bernadine Evaristo who are really changing what feminist literature and the way it presents means. And then you have women-led publishing houses, for example, Ala Books, uh, and we have Taiba with us here today, or Peaches Publications in the UK. And these are all significantly changing the course of literary conversations because of the way that they are led. How do you think that that has been influenced by the first wave of female authors uh, like Angelou Chuktai or Wolf, just to name a few? Daiba, if you want to start us off. Yeah, sure. Well, I want to begin by thanking uh, Ananke for inviting me to this brilliant festival. It really is wonderful to be here. And, you know, speaking on this topic gives me a very uh, meta kind of feeling, you know, because I, I just cannot separate my own experience um, as, as a female author, you know, from the question. And so that's the only lens I can use, you know, to look back through time. But um, yeah, to once be living and writing on the cusp of two centuries. I think that applies to all of us over here. Uh, I mean, when you, you look back over the past hundred years, we've studied a major chunk of, the, of those years and we've lived them as well. And, and for that reason, most of the stuff we know, you know, by our rough predictions, um, it just comes really instinctively to us as, as women, as um, women with a literary bent, so to speak, um, of incredibly powerful reawakenings of, of female thought, I would say. And they've been, I mean, one after the other, they've been such immense, such immensely powerful, you know, feminist literary figures uh, or voices who have been, I would say, resuscitating older movements and older stories. I won't say they were doing anything new. I won't say that because to put it really simply, women have been at the fore of the literary world um, ever since their male counterparts have been. You know, I mean, uh, what, I think the first American publisher, the first newspaper publisher, was kind of the same thing. Um, I hope I'm not getting her name wrong, but I think it was Elizabeth Timothy, and she was living and working in the 18th century, right? But we don't really talk about that, which means that the problem lies in a lack of representation and unfair chances. You know, it was never a fair game. And that's where, you know, patriarchy, unfortunately, comes in. So um, having said that, I also would like to add that it's a little dangerous and deceptive to assess and evaluate anything through history or through time, you know, because time has a way of moving forward and so the job is never done all over again from scratch. 
And I just want to give you a very, very immediate example, I guess, um, from Pakistani literary media or Pakistani culture, you would say. But definitely the Pakistani world of letters, um, you know, civil writer, Hasina Moin. And I think not just in Pakistan, but I would say in the majority of the, of the South Asian world, we're all familiar with the bold, brazen, beautiful depictions of womanhood that she put forward. And that was what, uh, like almost 40 years ago, I think. And um, well, I won't go into the details, but you know what kind of stories our national TV is churning out. And to put it in a nutshell, um, we basically just show two women who are content being juggled by one man. And that's pretty much the staple story. So we've definitely gone back, I would say, a thousand steps. So, yeah, definitely the job needs to be. Yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head with, you know, talking yeah. about how this conversation is so personal to all of us as writers and being part of this field that you have to have that lens be a part of it. And I mean, she rest in yes. power. Uh, she really did. Uh, I mean, she was someone that I think no one has ever been able to match up to. So it's it's always good to, I think, look back and, and know that those people were there when we're really disappointed with what's going on today, which I think uh, a lot of us are. And Lakshana, um, what about you? Uh, is there anything you'd like to add so, on this? Yeah, I mean, I'll just add to what she said, but I think every generation, I think there have been so many different strands in this um, literary tradition, in the feminist literary tradition. Each author has brought something new to the table. We are coming from Brontes to the, or from or Brontes and Austens from the 1800s, and even for them, it was revolutionary. For example, Jane Eyre, the idea of Jane Eyre was revolutionary for those times, because um, for, for the mere fact that earlier femininity was identified with just beauty. I, I think the fairy tales were a clear, very clear example of that. If you look at the fairy tales from the 1690s, where the male where male authors were deciding what women should be, the code of, you know, int introducing these ideas of civility of mm -hmm. what, expect what is expected from women. But I think that was overturned by the Victorians, the Victorian authors as much in within their own paradigm as much as they try to do it. For example, Jane Eyre to Jane Austen, they were mocking con continuously at how women had to, you know, what the regulations imposed on women. And each of them, from mm. Jane Eyre, I mean, from Charlotte Bronte to the 1930s, to the, 80, uh, to the nine, early 1900s, as the political um, atmosphere also became more charged and women started campaigning for their own rights, each, there was a different strand each time of, of thought, for example, a wom women's sexuality, how it's been repressed, how, you know, um, that's how why Re Rebecca, the Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca was so revolutionary in its own time. For the mere fact that a woman's sexuality, a powerful woman is feared. And because we don't, I mean, if, you, the, if we have all read the book of Rebecca, we don't know who the character is. I mean, we don't know her personally, but we know about her, that she's a powerful woman. She had affairs and she was, she was, a, she was, everyone feared her, a man feared her. So from there and to Isma Chuktai's the Lihaf, where she addressed the a love story between two women. Of course, later on it was to criticized and she was, to, and she was, uh, she had to face a lot of um, uh, flack for it and had to go to court. But um, her idea that she very clearly said, this is happening all around. I mean, women, love stories, this kind of a love stories. She said, she made this very clear point. Are you more worried about what's happening under the quilt? Or are you more worried about the gender of the author, that the fact that she wrote it, and that she brought out these um, points? So yeah, so I think we have come a long way and um, each generation has brought something new to the table, something more revolutionary, bold. And from the 1960s, the fr sexual revolution in France, the French feminists of Kristeva, um, Elan Sisu. And there's a long, it's a, we've come a long way. We still have a long way to go because we have come from hiding on, uh, from uh, using male uh, author names to, uh, to break from patriarchy because at that time, women fiction, women were not supposed to write fiction. And now we are here.
we are winning the um uh, uh prize i mean oh. like bernadette bernadette never <laughs> so yes we have a long way to go but we've come a long way so we definitely have a voice in literature i think um we're going to come back to that point you mentioned about women having to write under I think, yeah well yes of course they were ahead Yeah, sorry, I, there's a bit of a lag. I just wanted to add to the points Lakshana was making. Um, I'm glad she brought up uh, men, uh, the Brontes because, um, you know, the, the term women's fiction is, is so highly problematic. I mean, it seems to insinuate that, that certain themes, certain sto stories that only belong to a woman's domain. But if that were true, you know, the greatest love story, the most timeless love stories in the world would not have been written by men. I mean, and these are the stories we've all grown up on, um, much to our misery, <laughs> uh, you know, Anna Karenina and all of uh, <laughs> Hardy's heroines and all. But to be really honest with you, I have yet to come across a truer depiction of the gorgeous mess that is a woman's heart than what I found in Anna Karenina or you know, in Return of the Native or Far From the Madding Crowd. But having said that, you cannot ignore or overlook that, that sense of doom and despair, you know, that, so that is clearly, I would say, the reflection um, of, 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 of the male gaze vis-a-vis -vis the female predicament. So there definitely is. Um, some truth behind that concept of sadly being, you know, a division in um, way approaches the same subject. Yeah, there's a difference yeah, um, in how may, uh, male authors write uh, women and how the f and how women authors write the women from from um, from couple of, if you look through the years <laughs> for the past hundred years. But women have always represented as very hysterical, emotional, yeah. over emotional by male authors. And I think that kind of stereotype doesn't necessarily yeah. exist within literature, does it? You know, we see even women who are working towards changing that being boxed up into stereotypes. Uh, and Lakshana, I'm going to go back to what you said about Isma Shiptai being taken to court for what she wrote. Uh, and it reminds me of something Wal al Sadawi says. Uh, and you know she just passed away recently and there's been a lot of conversation about her work is, and, and the impact that it has well she said something in one of her books about how she was interviewing someone um, I'm forgetting the name forgive me uh, and they were told that oh you are a savage and dangerous woman and her response to that was it is society that is savage and dangerous uh, and you know Naval was uh, an absolute revolutionary. Her version of feminism, her version of liter women's literature, her woman's voice did not prescribe to anything that anyone told her. It did not prescribe to Western feminism. It did not prescribe to what Egypt's yeah. regime thought she should be. Um, you know, do you think that we have more voices like hers right now in literary discourse or has this oversaturation or I guess what I would say commercialization of feminism often made it difficult for global stories of women to be heard. Lakshana, you want to start us off? Um, sorry, your voice lagged a bit in that. Can you repeat that last point you made? No, no, I was just asking if you wanted to start us off. Well, that Taiba, go, if Taiba wants to go first, I thought she was going to say something. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, sure. I can go we first. well, okay, okay. Um, sorry. I think that pre sorry, <laughs> I think we mixed up again. No, no, go ahead. Thank no, no, Lakshana, please go first. So I do, I do think we have several voices today. Um, we do have several voices today of women coming forward because there has been a lot of revolutionary literature by women. I think Bernadine Neveresto is, I, I mean, Bernadine Neveresto, Margaret Atwood, um, The ha Handmaid's Tale. These are ideas of women and how they are, I mean, how it's, it is, has a very, um, what do I say, a revolutionary impact on the dis uh, literary discourse today. Because, you know, women, we, I mean, like I said, we, we are not, the idea of a women in literature, it's not just as, you know, either, you know, like um, getting married or, you know, staying within the household. It's not just related to the domestic sphere. These are women who question their own identities 
and i think the world needs more stories like these where you where the women get to where the women assess their own identities their race within an oppressive culture and i yeah this is what i was saying sorry that yeah I'm yeah sure. so according to me i think that predicament of not being able to fit in either the east or the west it comes from a deeper problem and i would say the problem of representation mm -hmm. and i would say that that pressure and that burden and that baggage that we attach to what represent representation mean means or should mean because it's it's a really flawed concept i mean but ourselves so i mean as much as we try to be a voice of um, of social groups of our gender the discourse um when we step forward when we voice our mind uh, we are basically doing that from a place of privilege right mm -hmm. so if there's an author coming forward coming forward from from india or pakistan or south africa mm -hmm. or canada we are globally united by i would say just two three things education family support and opportunity you know and that's just putting it bluntly and and those are the mechanisms that can make you or break you right so country it doesn't work that way i mean however noble my intentions might be um if i write about a woman's daily suffering in rural pakistan um how honest can it be i don't know what that reality is like i've never experienced it and for i mean i won't say unfortunately but that is the sad truth so even if my compassion is there my empathy is there that woman should be the one to come forward with her story but due to her situation she can't so if anything wonderful feminist figures have been enablers of conversation but they are definitely limited by by their freedom as well right so and i would say feminist movements are never the same anywhere in the world because we are battling very very different things um yeah. misogyny and patriarchy are two very different things you know so um but having said that i do want to add that you know since society keep position we are constantly being pushed into a very very deep preoccupation with the self you know we are constantly guarding our physical selves our physical safety our sexual safety our emotional safety right our 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 peace of mind so because of that constant yeah preoccupation with the self i would say women um whether they want to or not they are constantly in touch with what the human experience is all about right um for that reason i think that women's stories go beyond stories of gender they go beyond issues of gender and the, and they get subsumed within uh i would say larger stories of struggle and suffering and resilience and because of that their stories or their voices become the voices of oppressed marginalized communities racial groups social groups and all and and we've seen that especially in the last century you know where those stories came together beautifully it was a feminist i mean i would say an example there's a lot more happening there um i'll just if i could just add on to the point of how women's autobiographies i think since the 1970s i think they found a space i think many authors found a space with the the genre of the literary tradition of autobiographies where they could freely 
express themselves of you know of all the pain and so the ones who could the, the these are the authors who could like you said there were many whose voices we'll never hear or we won't know about or they're massively un underrepresented in the world in the world culture today but the, in i think from now from 1970s till today the, there was there's been a growth of autobiographies from angelou i think you know this where they get to express their pain and suffering so and this bring and this level of traumatic experiences is also very crucial to know to for the for people to, for for a woman to send out to the world for a message to the women to send out to the world and perpetuate a different kind of literary tradition also yeah i think both of you have said some really important points in you know furthering discourse in a way that taiba like you said is relevant to the kind of representation we are seeking and you know i think you're 100% right in saying that feminist movements across the world are not the same uh yeah. you know we see al put uh, after nawal al sadawi's passing we saw a lot of media outlets referring to her and even a wikipedia page refers to her as a simone de beauvoir of the arab world and that is something that is just very upsetting to me i think as as a woman because people need to do their homework bovard's feminism was very different bovard's understanding of feminism was also very different yes it was revolutionary for her time for 1940s but if you look at it her i mean as far, as, as much as she wanted to break away from patriarchy and dismantle and her, um dis distance herself from motherhood again the i think the uh, idea of bovard simon de bovard was to you know you have think like a basically think like a man in in the end if you uh, to um yeah sorry my voice cracked sorry i think you cut out a little bit if you could just repeat the last point that you were saying yeah i said as you know i'm saying bovard has been on the if she was revolutionary for her times and considered the mother of all feminist texts but i'm saying since um since then feminists have also criticized her for her idea of distancing herself from the concept of motherhood and you know women because uh it has been under much debate since then her ideas that is she just saying be like a man think like a man at the end of the day you have to act like a man to fit into this world so hey bye i think you have something to add as well sorry this internet is just not being great i just want to say you know there's always yeah there's always this danger of overusing a term and um turning it into something it really shouldn't be i mean okay it's as an organized movement organized thought but really it is just a sense of self preservation so it's a primal consciousness and that everyone is entitled to you know so again it has nothing to do with gender yeah i think um it's 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 so great to have this dis discussion with you guys i mean the, the insights that you are sharing uh it's it's so enlightening for me as well and honestly i think it's just so refreshing to have this conversation without someone in the desi world uh just thinking that capitalism is a bad word uh, so there's that too <laughs> yeah so the idea of feminism has grown, gone under so many changes i mean it's gone through so many changes since so it's in see like even from 1900s onwards i think like i said mm. from louisa may alcott to for little women her idea or jo the woman who did not want to just get married even though that that text can be criticized in today's um, time of course but for that time a, a book like little women is was revolutionary a character like jo who wants to go out and read virginia yeah. wolf who could criticize yeah. that a, you know a woman's space argued what a woman's space is uh, her little story of shakespeare's sister yeah. <laughs> so yeah <laughs> there are different understandings there have been several understandings of feminism throughout the years we can and each one has brought something new yeah yeah, yeah. I think want... it's. I think it's. <clears throat> I find it funny how, you know, um, concepts of what courage and independence, or just um, the ability to choose one to to choose to live one's life the way one wants to, the way it's seen as something which just belongs to the arena of modernism. It's so disturbing, but 
it's it's hilarious especially when you see hilarious in a good way when you see literature all over the world and i mean today um uh, and female authors how they are going back to the treasure trove of myth and legend to reclaim stories female stories of incredible strength and resilience and is an author i'm absolutely obsessed with uh, madeline and cersei <laughs> and, and cersei is the one i just completely swear by okay oh, yeah. cersei i agree <laughs> and um you want it's it's a feminist retelling of um, yeah. cersei's story you know cersei from from the odyssey and if it's a feminist retelling it's not something that the author had to force into being it's not something that she really had to work on it was effortless because the myth was there just you know offering it up so if anything she's just bringing that story back to life and we're not talking about just you know a piece of fiction that was there in what the 15th century or 16th century we're talking about a myth we're talking about primal narratives so this is a story about um i won't bring in her other um supernatural gifts just a woman cersei who is um pushed into a solitary existence by by her family so you can replace family and bring in after that the novel basically just details um her journey into or towards so that's just been really eye opening for me you know so um adding on to the point of uh, mythology retelling a mythology i think i think <laughs> i think it's important to bring up also chitra devkarni's books on palace of illusions and um, the enchanted forest where she uh, wrote the uh, mythology um, of sita and um, dropadi from their point of view and made them powerful rather than she gave them a voice instead so yeah i think yeah, this is yeah, this yeah. is also a very uh -huh. powerful it's become a very powerful voice in lit, uh, recent literary traditions also mm. to give the voiceless a voice otherwise we just know the myths from the masculine point of view and right now women authors yeah. like yeah. um chitradev karuni have made them the most powerful in their stories have given them the right to choose Mm. 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 and you know and th th there's this concept there's like we when we talk about the voiceless i mean the voices have always been there but they've just been yeah. sadly deliberately silenced yeah so if anything it's just a process of unsilencing you know sure so that's something really owe ourselves <laughs> as female authors yeah. <laughs> yeah i think i've always uh, felt a little bit uncomfortable with the term voiceless you know because it's not like we or marginalized groups don't have a voice it's that like you I said know, they are deliberately silenced yeah. so when you say voiceless yeah. it's very passive you know like okay they are voiceless yeah. it is what it is but when you talk about being deliberately yeah. silenced then you have then you yeah. understand yeah. that there's an unsilencing that does need to happen as well yeah. um and you know just adding yeah. on to this conversation about uh, reclaiming my mythology uh, there's been a lot of conversation around medusa as well Uh, and growing up yeah. you know, i don't think i could ever yeah. have imagined that uh, there would be another side to medusa's story uh, but but there is uh, she uh, the the men that she is turning to stone uh, is a, is a response to the men who raped her uh, yeah. and that is a narrative that is always yeah. left yeah. out and somehow we we managed to like coming back to what lakshana said about these traumatic experiences that are now being shared they are important you know a lot of people uh, yeah. i think particularly a lot of people who are very big on image building yeah. uh you know making sure that people don't think that uh, south asia or the global south in general is presented as i guess pitiful to the world um but it's it's important to talk about these stories of trauma and violence because they reframe the narrative completely yeah and uh yeah yeah there's there's just so much that i want to discuss between what you guys have said uh but sort of just jumping back to you mentioning luisa may alcott as well she's one of those very early writers uh and uh, and part i think part of a group that has since been criticized uh in some aspects as well um how do you think she and other writers like her and this this criticism in general of perhaps i guess what i would loosely describe as first wave feminist literature uh has sort of fit into a more modernist uh wave that is now here 
see today's understanding of feminism is very different from what was happening back then. But for I mean, now we criticize little women and say it's not feminist. Yes, it does not fit into today's understanding. Of course not. Today we, I mean, there is a there's like hundred years worth of difference. But now a Louisa May Alcott, this is her idea of Joe. Yes, uh, who wanted the idea of a tomboy? Basically, all these women who are fighting, you know, the I mean. Who want who was tomboy? I hated the same word tomboy, but yeah. But thanks to the light, and it was just in, ingrained in our heads. <laughs> but the idea of Jo, who is um, while all her other sisters, Meg, the domestic one, there was Beth, the tranquil one. Amy had Amy had spirit, but Amy was vain. <laughs> At the end of that, I mean, those were the flattering adjectives attributed to Amy. But here was Jo, who refused to, who did not want to marry at first. Yes, she fell into the category of marrying, but after she made sure that she had a profession, she was going forward in life. that she could do something with you know with her i mean with her career with her literary career she wanted to write of course jo was a representation of louisa may alcott also so so i think um, little women if you look at the time it was written in was pretty revolutionary for for those times of course maybe it doesn't fit into our understanding today but if i think if you have even read a um, ella montgomery and shirley okay again another character who insisted who wanted to go to college who taught who had her own who had a this is the 1900s so a character like an ann shirley um wanted to go to college writing yes she fell into the house you know the idea of the housewife at that time but again she made something of herself to write before you know becoming um just marriage material as such so i think every uh, author at that time tried to fight these um restrictions and limitations in their own way hmm. Yeah, there's a bit of an internet lag, so I'm just waiting to see if uh, Taiba has anything to say. Maybe. Yeah. No, I'll just second everything Lakshana said, and the job is still half done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot on our shoulders. Yes. Like I said, we have a long way to go, <laughs> but we have come yeah. a long way. But. <laughs> there's still a journey to be made <laughs> it is definitely a long road um and what you said reminds me of uh how i recently came across uh, khatija mursur's the women's courtyard uh originally yes. it was angan uh, but i read the english translation um and there's a lot of debate about whether or not similarly if it is feminist um because when you look at alia the main heroine she has all these views that don't prescribe to the way her mother or her aunt think but at the end of the day she complies and i think that compliance is what bothers a lot of modern day feminists as well um but what they don't understand is that for her just thinking those things or just choosing forget thinking for others at that point just choosing her own path to be different which she does um like you said is revolutionary mm -hmm. for the time uh, and this brings me back to what taiba actually said at the beginning of the session about how uh, looking at things through history can often be a little bit dangerous because um you know we yes. somehow and i think a part of that is because somehow we fail to understand what was going on at that time so we expect that um you know everything should fall in line with what we believe now but but that's not necessarily possible uh you know we don't really live in a utopian world where everyone believes all the great things all the time and mm -hmm. uh, and struggles are definitely very very different mm -hmm. uh, across time across time across regions mm -hmm. across experiences class exactly and sapta when you assess the climate the political climate political social climate also and uh and so just to close off uh, today's session i think perhaps a little bit of ad advice from you both but also a comment on you know how whether the women authors of today uh the writers of today uh what they can take away from the struggles of their foremothers you know who had to deal with uh writing under male pseudonyms who had to deal with censorship who had to deal with being taken to court uh being fought for for their views uh you know we had we had george eliot like you said a uh, women were always supposed to write about a specific topic and so writing books like silas marner uh was something that uh, eliot could never have done under her real name um you know what uh, look looking back at those struggles and how they paved the way what advice would you give new authors today well um <laughs> very vivid example comes to mind right now when you brought in the the male pseudonym bit um and this is again an example yeah from literature and film 
there was this really powerful novel written, I'm not sure, early 2000, 2004, I'm really not sure about the date, by Meg <clears throat> Wallitzer. It's called The Wife. And I think in 2017, there was a really powerful movie on Netflix. Adaptation. I think starring Glenn Close. So a female author who is a literary genius prize for literature for a lifetime's body of work. But the irony is the world doesn't know that because not only has she been hiding behind a male pseudonym, but a living male persona, her husband's identity, who takes credit for her work. So that just really got me thinking, I mean, if the world can be that easily fooled. So clearly there's, there's no gendered voice in literature, you know. So uh, it's just a preconceived bias that comes with a name. So that's the only, I mean, I, don't, I won't say advice, but I think that's what I'm saying, art. Don't be conscious of yourself. Don't be conscious of what you're writing about, where you're coming from, what direction you're carrying with you, where you're headed. Art is art. And ultimately, the world will see it for what it is. regardless of the shackles society is at a few places at a few other places but i really believe in it i mean a book will find its destiny a story will find its destiny and no one can really get in the way so, yeah. i'll just add i think she summed it up pretty well <laughs> we have to keep fighting <laughs> keep fighting the good fight to make our voices heard to make it even louder and yeah carry on that literary tradition of writing. Just, it's our form of catharsis and ex expressing yourself in a world that wants, to, even if it tries, even a world that tries to silence you <laughs> and will keep trying to silence you because let's just face it, these things are very, very deep treated, deep rooted. So yeah, we need to, we need to keep, keep pushing, keep pushing the envelope as much as we can. <laughs> I think that is such a great note to end on and such great advice for anyone listening. Uh, and as much as I would absolutely love to listen to both of you talk forever, it has been because it has been such a brilliant experience for, for me. Uh, we have to uh, close now because this is the end of our session. Uh, okay. But for all of you who are watching, um, there are so many amazing sessions to come in the next two or three days. And hopefully I will see you again soon. Uh, Taiba and Lakshana, thank you so, so much for all your insights uh, and for everything that you have shared. Thank you. It was a brilliant discussion. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you for bringing us. It's been such fun being here. Thank you. <laughs>